Well, it is good to be back. Got to go and be somewhere else and worship with Christians in a different place, and it was a wonderful time. And but it is it's good to be back, to be home, to be with you this morning. One of the things that came up in the past week or so was I watched this movie, and this movie. I watched it, and then all of a sudden I started seeing some comments, some comments about what this one friend of mine thought about it. And I was just shocked because I was like, I didn't see any of that. I I didn't see any undertone. I admit, and I, I am oblivious at times, you know, sometimes I don't see things and don't, but I didn't, and I, so I thought about his comments, and then I went and thought about the, the movie some more, and thought, okay, well, yeah, I could maybe, okay, I could see that. And I started to ask myself, well, what is it that created such a different view? What was it between me and him? Because we're, we're really a lot alike. I mean, there's, there's so many things that we share alike. It's not like we're opposites, you know, somebody. I mean, honestly, we do. We share a lot. And I just was very baffled by the, the idea that how two people so similar and Christians, that we could look at this movie and have such radical viewpoints about it. Um, and so it made me start to think about vision. We start thinking about vision and how important vision is. We understand that. This is a physical thing. You know, it's, we understand our eyes and how important it is. And if you don't have good vision, I remember the first time I got glasses. And I honestly, I didn't get them until I was you know, nearly 30. Well, I got them at 25 and didn't need them really. But when I got them, I remember putting them on and and looking out at the Oregon Mountains, and it just popped. I'm like, wow, look at that. Whoa, look at the details in the mountains. And you could see things. And I'm just standing there. I'm like, they've been there forever. The only thing that changed was I put glasses on. They didn't change. My vision had changed. And so it's been like a life lesson in a lot of ways as I go through life. Many things like that. You know, and, and my vision is not the same. This is not the same prescription that I had when I was 25. As a matter of fact, they're changing again. I'm going to have to go and look, talk to that doctor again because it's like just within a year, again, they're, they're changing. And he told me they're going to change. So how does that apply when we talk about our spiritual life? Because I see a lot of Christians that change. You know, their spiritual views on things. and. Sometimes for the better, sometimes different. And sometimes I'll talk to a Christian and we, we have the same faith, you know, same plan, we believe in the same way to be saved and everything. But there are particular verses that we don't see the same. And there's no harm, no foul. There's, there, it's never gotten contentious and stuff. But it's kind of interesting. We bring things that we have developed throughout our lives, our experiences, to what we perceive currently. And I say currently because at this moment it's what it is. We live in a world that's very visual, don't we? We drive through. You go downtown and you look around. But what do you look and when you see this picture? What pops to you? What grabs your eye first? Because I bet you it's different. I bet you mine, what, what I'm grabbing when I popped that picture up and looked at it, maybe it was the palm tree. The palm tree. Did you all see the palm tree there? Was that, was that what everybody saw and focused on first? Maybe not. Maybe it was that red car. That red car popped. And you saw that. And you focused on that. And you saw, oh yeah, look at that red car. You know, I mean, there's a lot of things that... But it's the same picture, isn't it? It's the same view. The exact same picture. We, you know, we have a great farmer's market. I love our downtown now. And when I walk through and I see all the different people that are walking around and you see the different dress and... Uh, their boots or tennis shoes or flip-flops or Crocs or whatever it is, purple hair. Just all the diversity when you look at people. And you just, I don't know, maybe, you know, you just kind of wonder, well, how did you come up with the idea that purple hair was nice? I'm just saying, you know, I mean, I just always kind of wonder, you know, and I'm not knocking purple hair, please. So if you got purple hair, don't get offended. I'm just, I just don't see that it's the same that you do. Doesn't make it right or wrong, does it? About the color of hair? I mean, I'd be comfortable with it. We drive along, we see buildings. What do you see in this? What do you see when you see that building? What do you feel? Because you see, feelings are tied to 
questions. Do you see the architecture of this beautiful building? Do you see, or do you just see a church? Do you see just a Catholic church? Or do you, or maybe you're one that just saw the fountain? But every one of us can agree on one thing: that picture is the same picture. I did not hand you multiple pictures with different views. It's consistent, isn't it? Has not changed. Kind of see where I'm going with this? Because vision really has a huge impact on the influences of what we understand, what we think we understand, you know, and what we think. So I saw somebody, I just exposed my, I guess you say, prejudice against purple. <laughs> and said, you know, when I saw somebody with purple hair, pop, you know, it wasn't something that was just natural for me. I don't. Don't, don't hang around that. You know? But when you see people, you have already come to that moment with thoughts and beliefs already sealed. They're sealed. It's a gut check. It's one of those things that happens spontaneously, whether you like it or not. When you see things, they just boom! There. You can't go, whoa, I ain't going to think that. No, it's already thought. Because that's who you are. That's the way we live. That keeps us alive. I mean, there's a survival part of that. The problem with it, it's because, there's no problem with it because God created us that way. God created us, but when He created us, He put us in a beautiful garden. It was perfect. There was no sin, no decay, no death. It was beautiful. So when we saw things, we had no knowledge of evil. So everything we saw was a positive attitude, beautiful, amazing. But sin entered. And we started seeing something different, didn't we? We started seeing not only the physical environment change, but we started witnessing things changing in moral behavior as well. Here's another test. There's a woman in this picture. What woman do you see? Now, there's two women in this same picture. One is a beautiful woman. Who saw that? Now, who saw the old, witchetty looking one? Same picture. Isn't that amazing? That, that to me, is such a spiritual lesson for us today when we look at people. You know, I went down to, to uh, Texas. And, and preached that morning for one congregation. And then I drove you know, an hour away and preached for a different congregation. And I was really comfortable. They shared culture the same. No purple hair. I mean, I'm sorry. I mean, you know, things that we share that we're comfortable with, we were fine. It was nice. But, you know, when I think about other cultures, and you probably have seen these, you know, I get pictures and stuff from people from India the Philippines and different places like that, and you see that here they are at a, at a worship. Would you be comfortable there? Do you see the same brethren that you would see in this picture? And, and the other thing is, do they look like they're both at church? Showing respect to God? I mean, come on! Which one is showing more reverence to God? This group or this group? Now, be honest with yourself. Don't try to give the, can the, the, the right answer because you know it's right. What was your gut feeling? I'll tell you what mine is. This group, the one I'm showing now. If I was to go to the Philippines or India and I was to be at a place that they call church like this, I wouldn't feel comfortable. Look how I'm dressed. Look, look. Do I fit in? So oh, we have to we 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 get it, you know, we understand it. We're Christians, you know, we we're we're supposed to be compassionate and love, but we still have that. No matter how long you've been a Christian, we have these in us. We have this moral diversity that is beyond understanding at times. And it's getting more and more complex, isn't it? By the second. We got moral 
relativism, we've got genderism, we've got itism, we've got all these things going on around us. And I don't know about you, but I'm not comfortable with it. I like it the way it used to be. Like I heard my grandfather say, you know, he liked it the way he used to be. I wasn't comfortable with his way. He sure wasn't when I was growing up comfortable with my way. So what makes it right and wrong? And the, the, the problem is, again, we start out with that common vision when we're looking at people, looking at situations, and how do we then make the next action? What do we do next with that? Well, let's go to, let's talk about somebody who faced a lot of diversity. Now here you have this man named Paul. Familiar with him, right? The Apostle Paul. Let's recalibrate a little bit on who this guy is. This guy was a Jew of all Jews. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Pharisee. He was trained at the Harvard of Harvard of Harvards. He was a Rhodes Scholar of Jews. I mean, he sat at the feet of Gamaliel. He was the most zealous young Jew there ever could be. You want to talk law? That man could talk Mosaic law, and he could talk you under the table. You could not compete with this guy. And he was comfortable with Judaism. He was so comfortable with it that when a group of people started trying to proclaim that this man Jesus, the Nazareth, was Christ, he killed them and helped out killing them. Okay, whether it was direct or indirect, he himself confesses, I wreaked havoc on the church. He was not comfortable with that change. Even though he had grown up, the Jews were comfortable with Judaism in Judea. They were not comfortable traveling abroad. They were very comfortable where they're at. The Apostle Paul, though, he doesn't stay there whenever he goes to evangelize, does he? He travels, and he travels outside his comfort zone. He goes into cultures that are very diverse from him. I mean very diverse. Moral values that were off the scale. People who believe that you go to church, sleep with a prostitute, and you're righteous. Worship of Diana. And he had to teach them, didn't he? So he goes to this little place called Athens. He walks into that city and he sees all those statues and they're all proclaiming to be labeled to a god. Which he completely must have just had a gut-wrenching thought. And it even kind of infers that when Luke's writing that and recording it, he kind of says, it bothered him. When he walked around and he saw all of that, how did he respond? Left town? Got into you know, physical fights or verbal fights all the time? No. He focused on teaching the truth. He was able to look beyond that. But then he goes down to Corinth. And we see in Corinth, Everywhere he went, on especially the first and then the second missionary journeys, we see where whenever he would teach the gospel, they would attack. Whether they were Christians sometimes, they would turn on him, they would change what they believed in, or they were Jews, or they were pagans, whoever they were, the gospel truth would stand and he would be attacked. And I mean, beaten, stoned. At this point, to the second journey, he's already been stoned to death. Drug outside the city. Rose back up, went back in, and was preaching. That was before he comes to Athens. He was driven out of town in Berea because the people there were going to kill him. He flees down to Athens. He's in this really ungodly town with this culture of these elitists. He stands up and tries to preach the gospel to them, and they mock him. What is this babbler saying? But he preached. He leaves there, goes down to Corinth, <laughs> which is an extremely diverse cultural. This is, whenever you hear a city proclaimed as being a Roman colony, that is like the most endorsement, the biggest endorsement you can get as a city, as being Roman. This city was destroyed before Julius Caesar. When Julius Caesar became emperor, he rebuilt it. So Corinth was a very favored city to the Romans and was very Roman. So it had all the gods all around it. But everywhere he went, he had this adversary that was coming along. And at this point, when he gets in Acts chapter 18, and he is there teaching, 
once again, here it comes. I mean, every time he gets to the point where he reaches this, this point where the gospel is going on further. All that have received it, it seems like they've received it, and now they just come out and they attack him. Whether it's the silversmith in Ephesus or wherever they're at, Macedonia, it just reaches a point where that's it. I'm done. And otherwise, or you're under threat. You, the longer you hang out, the more you're going to be threatened. Then the Lord says something to him. The Lord sends him a message in 18, chapter 18, verse 9. Read with me. Do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking. And do not be silent, for I am with you, and no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. I know there's a pretty funny typo. Look what God's saying. Now, we have nothing that Luke records about him that says Paul was concerned, Paul was anxious, Paul was worried. But God knew it. So we know that Paul was very disturbed, very anxious, and feeling very threatened by what was going on while he was trying to preach the gospel. And he says, Don't be afraid anymore. Well, uh, I've been stoned to death once, Lord. I know, you know, I've, I've been brought back, you know, but I've been beaten and jailed. Don't be afraid. What did he say? They're not going to harm you anymore. For what? This is the key part about vision. The Lord could see that there were people still there that needed the gospel. I, God, saying, still have many people in that city. Well, then you don't need me, right? Because if you if if they're your people, they're good, right? No, he's talking about there are people here seeking him that I am showing favor to, and you are the instrument. And I can't allow, and I don't don't want you to be afraid. I want you to go to work. I want you to get past all the things that are going to distract you and teach. Why? Because those many people that are still out there, they have souls. God wants us to see people that have, they all have a soul. Even purple hair, (laughs) no matter how they dress, no matter how hard they protest against anything that I agree with, they have a soul. So I'm the barrier. That's what I see. A lot of times it's hard for me because Sometimes I can't get past that one thing that kind of stops me. Or like that image of the two women. Maybe I'm in the ugly one, the scary one. But there's a beautiful one there too, right? There's a soul in every living human. And God says, they're mine. And I need you. I need you. And that's what Paul talks about jumping over to Romans chapter 10. Just an excerpt of the, top of the point there. He says, But now how are they to call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in Him in whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without somebody preaching? Oh, okay, Ron, there's my out. That's you, Ron. He said it right there. There's Scripture. Ron, preacher, preacher, that's what we pay you to do, Ron. That, that's your job. Show me the pattern. But that's all the way. Because you know what? There were thousands upon thousands of Christians and churches established without even an apostle being there. Rome. Rome was one. We have no idea how that church came about. But we do that sometimes. We try to think that way. But he says, first off, Paul says, they have to hear the message. We jump back before this letter was written when Paul was in Corinth. He was hesitant, you see. He was starting to see something that was going to cause hesitation. And he was already prejudging the situation and the conditions where it was going to stop and maybe get him to pick up and leave. He ends up spending a year and a half there after this night. A year and a half in Corinth. A very, very immoral city. 
And we know the church continued to have struggles, right? He wrote two letters to them. But he saved a lot of souls. He saved a lot of souls. One of the things that at times we become discouraged and sometimes our vision gets blocked is because we fail to see His power. Where is it, Ron? Okay, gravity. The sun. Oxygen. Where is His power in your life? Because you need to see it. You need to stop for a moment and consider where you've come from, what you used to be. I mean, I you know we we hear this all the time, you know about, and we see it with younger people more so about they're always looking for the greener grass, right? And the problem is when you finally get to the point where you realize you know where that greener grass is, right where you're standing. That's that's where it's at why we keep looking around. And as Christians, sometimes we miss the power of God because we're looking, at, we're looking in the future. We're being held back by fears, anxiousness, just like what Paul was being faced with. But the message is, do not be afraid. There are many souls out there that are His. Go to work. Go to work. Seeing His power, like the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews, In Hebrews 4, verse 12, starting there. For the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even dividing to dividing the soul and the spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid before the eyes of Him to whom we must give an account. But what does that mean to you? If you're not using His Word, it's meaningless. If you're not believing in His Word, it is meaningless. It's just a beautiful Scripture to try to think about. And when you hear it, you go, wow, that ah, that, that gets me, you know? But we as Christians, do we really remember the importance of this? God's Word. If we had something that powerful that could give us and make us money, give us a retirement, I guarantee you we would be all over it. And we would never let go of it, would we? But God's Word? Eh. It's not going to give me much more money in my next check. It's not going to pay my electric bill. You know, it's not going to pay that outrageous gas price at the pump that I'm making. And oh, by the way, my utilities have gone up because everything else has gone up. And ah, ah, ah. What do you want? Because if that's the fear of the world that's happening around you, you need to wake up. But just like what God told Paul, And God understood one of the strongest Christians that we have seen had fear and hesitation. And that message, if God was here right now, He's telling you the same thing. Don't let fear stop your service to Me. There are souls to save and there are souls to keep saved. Two. There are some that can be lost because of the way that we are with one another. There are souls that need us to see. Are we allowing fear to stop us because we're afraid of what this economy can do to me? What the virus can do to me? When it doesn't matter because I'm going to die anyway eventually. Now I'm not saying and I'm not knocking and I'm not getting political about the virus. I'm just telling you, wake up. What's important to you? Eternity or a virus? You want to live forever? You're not going to do it. I'm not saying go get silly and get dangerous. And I'm not saying, get a shot, don't get a shot, wear a mask, fight the policy. I'm not. But there's a level 
that we stopped seeing the power in God's Word. We need each other. So what's your vision right now? Today versus three years ago. Why aren't you in church? Why don't you study the Bible? If the Word of God is that powerful, then why aren't you clinging to it? Using it? And wielding the power that it will provide you? Why? You see why I get a little upset about that? It's like, why would you not? But you'll hang on to social media. You'll listen to the news and get depressed and angry. And you'll listen. All of us will do that. But how much are we listening to God's Word? How much are we going to God's Word and putting that a priority over all this physical world that's going to go away? And that's God's message to us. Just like it was that night to Paul. It takes some endurance. (laughs) Trust me. You have no idea. I felt the same way. About being very discouraged. How many times I've looked around and seen the efforts that I'm doing and I wonder, what's it for? What's it for? And I reflect back on what Paul said to the Galatians. He said in Galatians 6 9, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have an opportunity, let us do good to all people. You see? That's your vision. All people, purple hair including, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Are we living that? Or are we afraid? How you see things are honestly shaped by your perceptions of what the world is doing to us and how we live. And when we see something right away, what's your gut reaction? When we hear about the fear and the real threats and going on in our country, what is the gut check? Is it, glory to God, I have, a, I have an eternity waiting for me. I have a crown of righteousness. Let the prices go up. Did you say that? Because I have salvation. I have a true Savior. That regardless of what the prices are, regardless of what's going on in our country, I have a Savior who will take me to a promised land. Do you? If you're with us this morning, there's something we can do to help you in that relationship. I hope that you'll take this moment to be serious about the way you see your life. The way you see salvation. If you're a Christian, maybe your vision's changed. Just like you need to go to the optometrist, maybe you need to come back to God and refocus. Change your vision while you have an opportunity. I hope I clearly demonstrated how Easily it is for our physical vision to be altered by us all looking at the same thing. We're all looking at the same Word of God. But what do you see? I see a Savior that gave His life for us. I see a Father that loved us so much that He gave that only begotten Son so that we may not perish. I see one that hung on the cross that bled and died for us. I see one that rose from that grave and ascended into heaven and set forth one of the most precious things there is, salvation to man because of that sacrifice. And what did that message come out on that day when the men understood and their vision was corrected? They said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And he focused them back to God's Word. Repent and be baptized, each one of you, in order to receive forgiveness of your sins. That's a correct vision of what God has said time and time again. So if there's anything we can do to help you at all this morning, please take this moment to consider how you're walking and living before God and your brothers and sisters in Christ and all mankind. And if there's anything we can do to help you by praying, if 
there's something you want to reach out to through YouTube and drop a line, let us know, let us help you. That's what we're doing. We're just people helping people get to heaven. That's honestly what it's about. Nobody left behind. Like Paul, I'm not sure when he heard that statement, there are still many people in this. You know who I thought of? Elijah. Elijah in that cave. When he thought all was lost, and God said to him, there are still 7,000. There are still souls to save. If you're one of them, think about it while we sing this song. If we can help you, let us know. Always stand and sing.